and hope for the best. There you go. <laughs> What's going on? How are you? <laughs> I'm good. I appreciate you for taking the time out for this. We we definitely wanted to highlight your work. I know oh, you guys. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. <laughs> I know you guys don't do a lot of interviews, but we figure this is the time. You know, with everything going on, we just want to talk about the history and maybe right. learn a couple of things about what you guys are doing right now. Yeah, we keep it a little bit like craft work. We keep it like a little bit secret. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I appreciate you taking the time out for this. But I mean, I just got to get started here as I'm sure. reading your, your bio. It's just incredible to see two guys from Denmark that have made such a huge impact on R&B. Um, you know, and this was before the internet really even became was a thing. So I mean, just take me through the journey in the early days. Well, it was a completely different scene that it is now, you know, um, growing up in Denmark, we really didn't really know about like, any issues with races or racism, whatever. We just listened to music and didn't really think about anything else because Denmark was such a beautiful place to, to uh, grow up in. And um, so I got hit by hip hop. I heard Grandmaster Flash, The Wheels of Steel. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the fuck is that? Like, what <laughs> are those sounds? Right. And um, it was just incredible. So I started and started DJing like crazy. <clears throat> Found out that those sounds came from like turntables. And uh, I couldn't afford like uh, two turntables, so I just got one. So uh, that's why I became so good at scratching because I just had one. <laughs> so I just would scratch <laughs> like the seven hours a day. And then I entered the uh, world championship in uh, at Disco Mix Club in mixing and scratching and became third in the world mm. in 1989. And that was kind of like the beginning of everything. Um, and that's when like DJ Red Alert discovered me. He was one of the judges brought me to New York and I got introduced to Flavor Unit, ended up becoming Queen Latifah's DJ. Mm -hmm. And we went on tour all over the world with Jungle Bros and Tribe Called Quest and Chill Rob G and True Mathematics. And for me, that's when I realized what hip hop was. And wow. when I started bringing up the race issue, which I think is very current right now, um, is that I didn't realize as a white guy, you yeah. know, uh, I had to sit down and really understand that hip hop really was uh, a cry from the ghettos. Like no one is listening to us and you can talk about, we can't say this and we can't curse, but you know what? That's our fucking reality. That's our day. That's how we live. And you either deal with it or not, but we're trying to show you guys how tough it is in these ghettos. And it was really a, an eye opening for me. And I became even more devoted into it. At one point I, I almost felt <clears throat> because public enemy was coming out and stuff like that that it was like, because there was no white guys. This is before like, you know, uh, you know, even Beastie Boys this is before them yeah. as well. So, um, you know, I remember I kind of like felt maybe I, I, I was wrong doing mm -hmm. this, you know, because I was out on the straight out the jungle tour and I got booed and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. I would just right away start mixing and scratching and people would be like, oh, okay. <laughs> but, but Latifah is the one that I owe everything to. She sat me down on the tour bus and said, never ever let the skin or the color of your skin determine anything in life. And mm -hmm. it just stuck with me. And she spent three hours with me explaining everything about what hip hop is and what it was behind it. And um, I just got devoted. So when I came back to Denmark, I was like, I got to go back, man, you know, and, and the TV started asking me if you want to, can you do some beats? And I brought in Colin because I didn't know how to play. And mm. we were actually originally three guys. It was Cutfather, Soul Shock and Colin. Okay. And that was, that was the beginning. We got a song on, uh, four songs on the Tifa's album, including this single called Fly Girl. And that kind of got it going. Wow. That, that's amazing <laughs> history. I mean, just talk about then from Latifa, like, was it hard for you guys to get placements because you guys weren't from the States? Like, how did you guys kind of get your foot in the door after that? Well, so we went back to Denmark and we, we opened our record company there and we actually had a lot of success remixing Danish artists, turning them into hip hop, <laughs> 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 which was hilarious. You having coffee? Okay, one second, then I'll join you. Yep. <laughs> ah, excuse me, I just came back from a run, so oh, I thought awesome. it was the perfect time for a glass of wine. Um, and uh, so when we came back, I, I, we went to New York and New York was just too competitive. Like you mm -hmm. had Puffy was starting, you had Teddy Riley, the king, yep. you had Premier, you had like, it was so many incredible producers there. And we just felt like we could not get uh, a foot in the door. 
So we went back and we got hired by, funny enough, Patti LaBelle wanted mm. to sound a little more hip hop and see like, who are these hot hip hop producers out there? And we had done all these remixes and, you know, who were buzzing a little bit. So we went to LA, that's where she lived. And that's how we ended up in LA. And I'm looking around going, palm trees, sunshine. Right. Okay. You know, and they had West Coast hip hop, but I felt except maybe, you know, Dre and a couple of the cats, I was like, we can, uh, we can, we can make some beats here. I, right. I feel like we can be competitive here. Um, so, you know, of course it was a funny story. Pat LaBelle shows up and she sits in the studio and she goes to me, like, go get me some coffee, get me ready before Soul Shot Colin arrives. Mm. And I'm like, okay, I've been here before. And I said, that's okay. I'll get you some coffee, but I'm Soul Shot. She goes, yeah, that's funny. Now get me my fucking coffee. <laughs> and I, so I run out and the runner goes up to him and goes, that really Soul, soul Shot. Sorry, I think I might, my phone fell. So that was just our life. We you know it was always like, wait, you're soul shocking. <laughs> right. <laughs> so that became just like our, it was just part of the journey. Every time we came to the studio, we had to kind of overcome that little thing that, yeah, not only were there two very white boys with this Danish mm. accent, but when we dropped the beats, it kind of started making sense. And I would say the biggest moment was when we sent the beat out and the beat went out to Tupac. Right, yeah. And we got a call back, but I don't want to rush your story if you want to. Oh, absolutely. Well, I mean, we'll definitely talk about Tupac later, but I just want yeah. to get into the creative process with you and Carl and, um, you know, just take me through, you know, the early developments of your sound. Like, how did you know that your sound was going to work? Like, what was that like in the studio? It was pretty hard because in the beginning, you know, I was so dead hip hop. And mm -hmm. um, it really wasn't until coming to New York, we went to New York every summer. Like it was just New York, New York, New York. And when Teddy Riley started combining R&B with mm -hmm. hip hop, which was really the first time when he started doing Alba Shore and started creating the beginning of Swing Beat, I, I just got hit. I was like, this is dope. Like you can actually take the beats from hip hop and put like chords on top. And because I had a soft spot for R&B, you yeah. know, I always kind of loved R&B, you know, it's kind of like, when you came home, it was like putting the R&B on. You know? <laughs> um, so, so that's when Colin came in with his incredible magic. And, and I did the beats. And he would start playing on top of them. And we would start create this Soul Shot Colin sound, which really is kind of, um, you know, really dirty on the beats. You know, even mm -hmm. the songs, the first number one we had was Before You Walk Out of My Life with yeah. Monica, yeah. which is like me just cutting up a beat underneath. And Colin just playing these like really poppy kind of chords and then yep. andrea martin writing this incredible song and we just realized wow there's no one doing this maybe because of our scandinavian upbringing you know yep. we grew up with melodies so we were so attached to melodies so we were really into melodies because in the beginning in denmark you don't understand what people are saying you just right. listen to the melodies and i think that's one of the reasons why max martin and and you know our dear friends you know uh norwegians and people out there that uh, stargate you know, yeah. doing Swedish producers because we're so attached to melodies. So we just got really into melodies. So all our songs had incredible melodies, but we also had so much hip hop yeah. going on underneath. So it was kind of like we became like the go-to for a lot of urban artists who wanted to cross over mm -hmm. and still, we still do it with credibility, not like get pop or cheesy, you know? Right. And uh, yeah, it just kind of took off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that, that Monica record is amazing because like you said, it has the hip hop elements, but then <laughs> it sure. also uses it with some of that R&B. I mean, just talk about working with Monica on that song. I think she was like 12 or 13 at that time, but she sounds like a grown woman. <laughs> she, was actually four, she was actually 14 when we did that okay. song. Yeah. So we had already started working a lot with Clive Davis. Yeah. Um, he kind of like, we, I remember the first meeting I had with him, we went in and I was kind of like, aware that he was a guy like that's mm -hmm. he's he's had everybody everybody ended up with Clyde in some way um and I remember coming in we we realized he taught taught me listen don't play me any more beats so mm. I want to hear songs wow. and I said if you want to get your beats out why don't you put a song on top then people will hear your beats and I'm like fuck and we had 152 tracks no one was taking Mm. had no songs on them so now we started exploring songwriting and i remember the first time we played three songs and he just played all three through and then he goes that is the most horrible three songs i've heard in my career wow and he looked at me 
And he goes, let me play you what we're looking for. And he started playing Jimmy Jam, Sir Lewis, uh, Baby Faze in LA, Teddy Riley. And we were like, okay, we got a way to go here. <laughs> and we came back and played another three songs. And he played, listened to them all three. And he goes, I thought I told you. These are absolutely horrible. Mm. And I'll play you another. And I think he was also testing us to see if we could handle this. And a lot of people, I think, would have actually probably cracked at that point. Because, right. you know, we didn't have much going on, really. So we were just in the studio down on Melrose, cracking out cockroaches everywhere and shit, and trying to get <laughs> our beats going. And it was really hard, you know. Fourth time we go back to Clive, it was at the Beverly Hills Hotel in one of the bungalows. And I was scared shitless by now, because mm. I got killed every time I played these records for Clive Davis. <laughs> and he played this one song, Oh, we played these three songs, and one of them was Before I Walk Out My Life, and he just stopped. He goes, I'll take it. And I'm like, what, what, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> I, I said, you know, we actually have someone who wants to, you know, record it. I think Tony Braxton is interested. Mm -hmm. goes, and he goes, listen to me, so you're giving me that song right now. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> and if you do it, I'll guarantee you have a number one Wow. in, in the next month or two. And I couldn't believe it. We, you know, we flew down. We put Monica's uh, vocal on it. She was amazing. Mm -hmm. um, just raw church gospel runs. Like, it was like we were just in awe with her. She was just so incredible. And we kind of loved that it had that street vibe. And it was, I think we recorded it in Dallas Austin studio, actually, in Atlanta. Um, and, and we just walked out and we just knew it. Like we just felt it and we sent it to Clive and he didn't change anything. And we, you know, it got mixed by, it was like to John Gass who mixed it, who was like, he did a lot of baby face stuff. And, um, and he came out and we had a number one record. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. And, and, you know, just to talk about that work with Tupac now, because yeah. earlier on, you just mentioned your fascination with hip hop from an early age. You guys are in the studio with the biggest hip hop artist at that time, probably the biggest rapper of all time, period. You know, yeah. what was your mindset like during that time working with Tupac? Because I know Tupac was the best. Well, it was really interesting because, you know, I, 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 as much as I love the R&B element we had going and we were in the studio with Brownstone, who was incredible because I yep. met my wife there in that session, um, who unfortunately passed away. Um, but... Um, so we love being in that environment, but I had so much hip hop in me. So I kept saying to my incredible manager called Randy Cohen, uh, and I kept just saying, um, can you please just keep feeding these hip hop tracks? Right. And I you know, and I send it to Tupac and I'm like, yeah, okay. You know, so optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> and we got a call back and, and he said, Pac likes three of the tracks and he wants to record. And I'm driving on the street in LA. I'm just like, wait, what did you say? <laughs> yeah, you got to go now. And everybody's, I don't know. It's like the studio is a little bit in the hood and whatever. And I'm like, okay, do me a favor. Can you call the management and just let them know we're two white boys? Like, let's just get over it. Like, if it's an issue, it's okay. I get it. Like, but I just don't want to go down there. I got scared. <laughs> you know, we're still from Denmark. So, you know, we weren't really like, you know, so when it got a little bit rowdy, it was like, whoa, shit. <laughs> you know, we're not really used to that. Um, so I just wanted to get out of the way. So I didn't go all the way down to Compton and then I had an issue. <laughs> so I'm driving and I got a phone call and it's Pac calling me. Mm -hmm. And I pick up the phone and he goes, I know who the fuck you are, motherfucker. And I'm like, okay, uh, you know, sorry. You know, I'm just, just, just ready to get it. And like, and he goes, I used to carry your fucking turntables. I said, what are you talking about? I said, who do you think put out your fucking turntables? when you're out performing. So we did a lot of shows with Digital Underground. Mm -hmm. okay. And um, he was a roadie for Digital Underground. Oh. Yeah, okay. So he actually, at one point, had set up my turntables for a show we did with him. You know, nowhere could I put those two together, like Tupac. And, and like, I just, <laughs> like, he goes, just bring, bring your white ass down to the hood, whatever. We went down there and it was like, whoa. For about like just, you know, again, just the story that he used to carry my turn Tim was like, are you kidding me? This is Tupac. Thought life, shirt off, bandana on. It was on. And it, the studio was packed. 
Wow. Because he liked to perform. He liked mm -hmm. to be pushed and be on the edge when he was rapping. And he actually had a ton of people writing. You know, not that he didn't write himself. He just picked up energy from everybody. And uh, the one thing there was at that time was everybody had to leave their gun mm -hmm. when they got into the studio next to the mixing board where I sat. So oh. at one point, <laughs> it was like just a stack of Gordon City. And I remember Colin going, I'm out of here, man. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, it's cool. I've been so much in hip hop for some reason. I got shot at like in Lower East Side at this place called Hotel Amazon in New York. And, you know, I don't know. I just kind of like, it was just part of the game. And, mm -hmm. uh, cool thing about that record was he wanted to pay respect to the east coast even though he's on the west coast don't sleep on pop yeah. i know he gets the west coast rap or stamp but he is as east coast as it gets you know he grew up there and he knew everything and he started like talking about all the rappers who were his influences and i knew everything wow. like when you were into hip-hop in denmark there was no one into hip-hop so the few people who were into hip-hop we were like we could be like in a science project. So right. I'm going, you know, let's talk about, you know, when uh, The Godfather came out with Spoonie G. Oh, yeah, shit, I remember that. You know, that's around, like, set it off, Big Daddy Kane. Yeah, yeah. And Bismarck came out, like, make music to the beat, you know. And then I'm uh, like, I'm just rolling with him. And we just created this record together. Wow. For nothing but the old school. And if you listen to it, it's all paying respect to East Coast. Wow. That's yeah, an incredible it, story. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. Of course, you guys did I Wonder If Heaven Got a Ghetto as well. That's a great so, one. So, so then the next one we did was we, we, we kept, he kept inviting us back in the studio. And I, you know, had the pleasure to hang with him a little bit. Yeah. Um, and he was just so full of fire, man. Like, it was like just, it was so incredible being around. Like, I honestly have to say, I've never met anyone like him. Like, he is the biggest, mm -hmm. you know, Whitney. Whitney's yeah. up there, but, but Pac was just, for me, like, it's hard to describe. But the next thing we did was Me Against the World. Yeah. And uh, we, he wanted to have some singing, and I was dating this girl called Puff Johnson at that time. Yeah. Um, and she was signed to Sony. And um, she ended up doing the hook. And, uh, and he called me, like, two days after, and he goes, yo, guess what? He goes, that track is going to be the title track of my album. Wow. And I'm, like, almost crying. <laughs> I mean, just, just coming from a small city in Denmark, you know, very small working class city called Aalborg, and, mm -hmm. and to end up and say I have the title for a Tupac record, you know, was yeah. just, it's very hard to describe. It was um, overwhelming, beautiful. So the next records you're bringing up, um, I Wonder If Heaven Got a Ghetto and Do For Love are done after he passed away. Mm, okay. So Afini calls, so I hope it's okay we're going all Tupac here. You just got to stop me if, if, if it's too oh, much. Oh, go ahead. We, I mean, we have a lot of history to talk about in r and as well, but you know, there's okay. a lot of Tupac fans right. here. <laughs> um, so um, Afini called me up and said, you know, obviously we, we all knew he passed away. And, and, and I must say, honestly, that when Shook came into his life, you know, for me, it kind of took a left turn that mm. I, I couldn't really keep in with. I could, I'll keep up with. It was just, it got a little bit too real. I feel Pac was super intelligent and super intellectual. We could have crazy conversations about stuff that I don't think anyone would ever think he would know anything about, books mm. and stuff. Um, but when Shook came in, it just got real. Like it became gangster. Like we were, we had gang members in the studio now. Like it just got really intense. And, you know, I kind of like just kind of like dropped out a little bit when he when it was death row. And after he had gotten shot in Vegas, Afini called and he said, you know, I've got a couple of records that he never got to finish. And I'm only letting people who knew him and worked with him finish these records. Mm -hmm. okay. And so she came up with like these security guys, seven foot or something like that. But these right. we, we used tapes back then. We didn't have. Pro Tools back then. It was still, I think we were using ADAT tapes, it was called. Right. And every time we put this tape on and transfer it to one of our machines to make it work, this guy's like, where's that vocal going? Good. That tape is coming with me. 
you understand? Wow. Yes, sir. <laughs> and Afini was there too. So if you put this vocal up, and I don't know if you can imagine, I had these speakers that were kind of up in the air at that studio. And he's just rapping, I want those heaven go to ghetto. And there's nothing wow. underneath. It's just an acapella. And she goes, just start working. And she go, I go, you want me to work while you're here? She goes, I'm not leaving. So <laughs> I had to sit there and I first did a version of, uh, when I even got to get it, it's like an up-tempo. That's kind of yeah. what he wanted with the piano. And then I said to Afinu, after I said, can I, can I just freely do what I, what I just want to do? And I started doing this weird, yeah. I, I was kind of into jungle at that time, you know, and I kind of did like almost a cut, cut jungle beat half tempo and he's rapping in double tempo so i'm actually in half tempo so he's sound now sounding a little more like what jc when he was bouncing and stuff like that yeah and um i just thought it was so fucking cool and maxi uh my wife in, uh, from brownstone is singing in the hook mm -hmm. just yeah. this sweet vocal and i just thought it was magic yeah and then the next thing she came with was this uh what you won't do do for love. He goes, oh, Pac loved this record. He did this, this, um, this, this rap. And I'm just listening and I'm just looking at Colin. We were obsessed with like Tri Call Quest, Jay Dilla, stuff like that. And I said, what if we fucking do like that? Almost Tri Call Quest beat. Mm -hmm. Because I knew how East Coast he was. Yeah. And Colin just started do, 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 do. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. All right, let's go. Wow. <laughs> so those those were done with his mom around, who also unfortunately has passed away. Yeah, rest in peace to both of them. Yeah, the yeah. work you guys did on there as well. I just want to take it back to R and B here. The record sure. you did for Tony Braxton, "I Love Me Some Him." That song, like that album at that time, was such a huge album. It was. Every song from top to bottom is like amazing, and you guys managed to you know to stand out with a record like that. Just talk about that song. <laughs> That was amazing. So that record, you know, we, you know, it's funny when you go back to listen, you can hear how we all were so inspired by each other. And yeah. no doubt was I in my Dewante swing moment, Jody's mm -hmm. moment when I did oh. that. Because the snare had to go, shuck, shuck. That was just what Dewante did. And it was yeah. just so hot when he did that shit. But I will say there's two things about that record. One, Andrea Martin, mm -hmm. when she came in and wrote that song, on top of Colin's guitar, yeah. while I'm just sitting messing around with the beat, we just turn around going, I love me some him. And I was just like, I don't like it. This is crazy. <laughs> and we just didn't, before I walk in my life, I'm like, Andrew, you're just, you're just the most amazing song I've ever been around. Wow. But I have to say the big kick was again, when we flew to Atlanta, it was just Atlanta back then. And we worked with Tony, and when Tony did that vocal, I'm not gonna lie, I could start crying. Wow. I had never heard a vocal like that. I thought it was just absolutely amazing she could sing like that. And mm -hmm. she was just an angel. Yeah. And her little vibratos and, and she knew, she goes, no, no, next one, next one. She, we didn't even have to work. She knew wow. which one was the right one. And we were just literally standing in awe with her. And I remember when she left, I'm like, that's the best vocal I ever recorded in my life. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I, still, I still feel that today. Yeah, and the work that you guys do with her, like even a song like Midnight, amazing. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Amazing song. Yeah, that was way later. Yeah, yeah. that was way yeah. later, yeah. 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 That's an amazing one. Yeah. Thank and then, you. Uh, let's fast forward here. Whitney Houston, Heartbreak Hotel. I just want to talk about the sound that you guys created with that, as well as the uh, Chico DeBarge record. Like, just talk about that sound. Like, where did that come from? It, it's a little bit from uh, I Wonder If Heaven Got a Ghetto. Okay. Uh, we kind of like started doing that. It had a little bit of that Timberland kind of thing, but it wasn't yeah. as syncopated as sometimes what he would do with like one in a million when he came with that. Are you kidding me? Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Everybody go home. All right. Yeah. Timbo. Sorry. You know, <laughs> bow down. But, but we had this kind of like do, 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 da, da. And then my beat was always set up better. Da, da, da. You know, it was always. Da. It just had like a half tempo, and that was another record just like that. And we wrote that with a girl called Tamara, and that was her first song. Big John had just signed this new writer. This mm -hmm. was her first writing session, her first song. Pretty good start. Her first song is Heartbreak yeah. Hotel. 
<laughs> so we take it to Clive. Clive instantly wanted, we had some drama with that because actually TLC won that record too. Mm. So L.A. Reid, you know, wasn't super happy with us because it was kind of the second time we've done that. He also wanted before we organized. Tony or whatever, so there was some drama going on. But we then flew to New York and I must say, you know, I was shaking in my pants. I know we had been in with a lot of people, but going into Whitney Houston was like a whole new level. And wow. as confident as we was, and especially me, I was out of control confident back then. I was just, you know, so driven. But I was a very little boy. And we kept driving to a house out in New Jersey. She had this massive mansion where her and Bobby lived. And we yeah. were recording at her home studio in Jersey. And every time we showed up the gate, we were told, sorry, Miss Houston can for today. And wow. all the way back to Man Manhattan. So we had done that like all week. We were kind of like, okay. It kind of took the nerves away a little bit. So when we went out there like the sixth time or whatever, we're just having our suite at the Waldorf or some fancy place, you know, because okay. we're working with Whitney Houston. So, you know, right. <laughs> there was budgets going on. And um, Robin, her assistant, came out from the gate. And I was like, oh, shit. The gate's opening. Oh, shit, the gate's opening. And you <laughs> walk in into this house that was incredible and we walk in with this indoor swimming pool and recording studio and we were setting up and we had our engineer with us uh incredible man american i don't know where i would have been without him um and and our manager was there and we we're just waiting for whitney and i'm walking around and i go to robin so so whitney does he live like upstairs is that upstairs and or what is she? he goes what she goes, come here <laughs> And we go outside, and it's just this massive, like, almost like a golf course. And at the end of this massive garden, there's a castle. Right. And she goes, that's where Whitney lives. And I was mm. like, holy shit. So she had bought this house that was the neighbor estate just to make a home studio. And there she came on her golf cart, her wow. and Bobby, driving down from the castle. And she came in. And... um and, you know, I just was a little boy from Denmark. Like, I just couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't be, I couldn't be Mr. Swag. I was just so blown away. Wow. And she goes in and she starts singing. Now, again, that's a complicated song because of this beat we always did at that point. We had that half tempo jungle shit going. So she has to bounce up. And she just wasn't used to that because for her, it's like just a ballad. So one take, and it was awful. Mm. And it stops, and I look at Colin, and he looks at me, and I said, I, a, I'm not telling Whitney Houston <laughs> that that was bad. And he goes, yeah. I'm not telling it either. So it's just quiet. And she stands in there, and she goes, what's up? And she came out and said, listen, you guys wrote this song. Just tell them how you want me to sing it. Don't be, like, she knew it. She was so experienced. She went in again, and it was horrible. She went in again, and it was horrible. And she goes, I'm done. And she left. And Clive Davis calls, and he goes, how's it going? And I'm like, uh, yeah, yeah, it's going good. You know, and I was just like, anyways, next day I'm going to make a short. Kelly comes in, Kelly Price, kills the vocal. Right. Like, blows everybody away. Faith Evans comes in, Faith, I mean. Yeah. Can, you, can you sound, can you have a voice Mm -hmm. more magical than her like you know kills it we do that so now we have the whole record the only problem is that this is the heartbreak hotel bobby was doing that part and clive has said to me i don't want bobby brown with this record oh. <laughs> oh, <man. laughs> so i'm just like and i got an amazing song with a terrible vocal from whitney houston and it's her and clive goes has she approved it and i go ah he goes so don't fucking come back here with a record where I'm not getting blown away by Whitney. It's Whitney's record, so she has to take them out. I'm like, oh. so I'm calling up to the house uh, and I say, hey, Miss Houston, you know, can you come down? Oh, no, I love it. It's good. Go for it. Just take it home. Mm. And I said, well, you know, I, I had Clive Davis on the phone. I knew that maybe would. And he says to me, you have to come and approve it. So I can't, you know, I mean, unless you want me to tell Clive that you don't want. No, 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 no. Okay. All right. Okay. So now she comes down with Bobby again. <laughs> and I play the song and she sucks. 
Mm -hmm. And it's quiet afterwards. And she goes, okay. She goes, get me this, get me that, get me that outfit, get me this steamer, get me this. I want to change that, use that microphone. I need this guy, you up there, I need that channel with that compression. <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck? And she goes in and she nails it. Wow. Like, like just only as only Whitney can. And it was just so incredible. And when she was done, I said, hey, can you maybe do that? This is the Heartbreak Hotel. She's like, no, 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 Bobby's doing that. And I said, well, maybe we can do it together. She, she went in, and she did it once. And mm -hmm. that's all you hear. I had to loop that. This is the, <laughs> that's all I got. But we got it. The phone was ringing. Nope. No so, worries. yeah. So, wow. yeah, that was a crazy story. <laughs> that's amazing. And, and with Kelly Price and Faith Evans, was that originally the plan to have all three of them on the song? Yeah. Yeah, that okay. was, that was the, you know, Heartbreak Hotel. I think that was Clive Davis who pretty much from the beginning wanted to be like a powerful female anthem. Mm, that's amazing. And then the Chico de Bars record, that was a big record at that time. Take and again, great one. again, I think Chico had just been in prison when yep. we did that. He just came out. Just the most incredible, lovely, nice guy. And again, yep. we pushed the shit out of that beat. That was around the time where we had just done 702, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You Don't Know. And yeah. it, again, that was actually Colin now taking my half-tempo jungle beat, making it up-tempo. Mm. So now he's actually going in like almost 125 BPM with the yeah. snares. And that's what Chico is too. We just pushed it so much. And I think it was a lot to do with our European influence we always loved that whole grime and dubstep and uh jungle music from like you know uh from from london you know underground we were always so inspired by that wow so i mean i gotta highlight this portion of your career here because i remember when you got it bad came out by usher and you guys did that remix and yeah. the original is obviously a classic to this day but i remember after the original had fizzled out of the radio they started playing the remix really yeah. heavy on radio and then i remember the other track you did the one for brandy broken hearted you guys did the oh remix. my god that's like just take remix. me to your approach with these remixes because it brought like new life to these songs that are classics to this day you know it's funny we absolutely loved doing remixes i think mm -hmm. i don't know how other producers some stuff like feel about it but we grew up at a time where every song in europe would have a remix like for example uh, Blacksmith, who was Tim Blacksmith, who was a big manager now for Stargate, who was amazing. They always did these Blacksmith remixes for the UK. They were mm -hmm. unbelievable. So we grew up with like soul to soul remixes of every song. We almost never really heard the original in Europe. So oh, we wow. were very familiar with remixes. So we took remixes extremely serious mm -hmm. um, and really sat with the vocal. And I have to say, Colin is the guy that nails it every time. He sits with the vocal, even before my beat, and he just rethinks and reapproaches the song with mm -hmm. new chords. And how he could nine out of 10 times make it better is to me still a mystery. Like he yeah. just yeah. was so incredible. And once I heard that, I would get so inspired on the beat and just give it everything I had. And especially with Lonely Broken Heart, we really kind of like did a new song because yeah. she was so, she was only 15 at this point. And we flew to Philadelphia and we did it at that Boys Men studio in Philly, by the way, which is insane because, you know, they each had their office. Boys Men were like, we're talking. They were doing it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, one year in Brandy, uh, <clears throat> yeah. They were in the studio together. Let's just say that. Yep. <laughs> and uh, they had a good connection. I think I can say that political correct. Sure. Yep. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we just caught that moment uh, when she was singing. And again, there you have another one, Brandy. I mean, can you get born with a more amazing tone? Like True. every time she just starts, it's just, you just melt. So, uh, I think our approach was taking them very serious and really trying to make it better than the original. Yeah. And someone just mentioned the Spice Girl record that you guys did too. You guys turned it from a <laughs> pop song to an R&B song. That was amazing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we just really, really, really loved doing remixes. And we, we, we had 
hits on the radio like every week almost. It felt like driving around in, around in LA, they would start playing our mixes instead of the originals. And it was just amazing to hear. Yeah. So I want to fast forward to the 2000s here, Soul Shock here. Um, these are some of my favorites. And I just wanted to highlight them because like, first of all, the record Moving On by Toya, that record is just like, you can still listen to that today and it's amazing. Uh, wow, Fallen Out. Thank by- you. Fallen Out by Keisha Cole, another one. Oh, I love that. Amazing record. record. Thank you uh, so much. Maya Record Can't Believe. I just wanted to highlight a couple, but, you know, we have to talk about the hits from the 2000s as well. I saw J.Q. Smith in here. I, I interviewed him probably about two weeks ago. The we record love J.Q. Together. Fantasia. By Fantasia. Oh, Great. my God. Like, I mean, J.Q. absolutely murdered that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember it very well. It was actually interesting because it's a sample from my Icy Bros, mm-hmm. but we felt we were so clever with it that we didn't want to clear it. And yeah. all the way up to almost two days before its release, it was going to get released without clearing that sample and we would have gotten a huge lawsuit. And right. so one girl who was working for Clive just said, that's Icy Bros, that piano. And we just had to clear that sample, which I'm sure JQ and everybody else was really happy with because now we had to give up publishing. <laughs> but besides that, that was, you know, Fantasia was, we flew to New Orleans to make that record because she was part of this X Factor, oh, no, sorry, uh, American Idol tour. Yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, wow, she was fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was a great one. And, and it was great to do it in, in New Orleans because it almost had that grit, you know? Yeah. Of, like, we were just in there. <laughs> yeah, that was a great one. Uh, I got to talk about this one here, JoJo's Lead Ghetto. And what I love about this one is it starts off as, you know, an R&B song, poppy R&B song. And then it, <laughs> the chorus, it just changes completely. Like, And the way you guys did that, if, if, you, if you guys had done that incorrectly, it could have came off as terrible. Terrible. You guys, oh, my you God. You guys managed to put it together and it worked. Like, talk about that one. It's interesting because the, the mix that came out of that record is the original demo mix that was done that I did on my little Mackie plastic board mm-hmm. because it was so gritty. And every time we mixed it, it did exactly what you just brought up. It kind of lost a little bit of its hip hop element and then it becomes a little cheesy. Yeah. But before we go there, Jojo shows up 12 years old. Yeah, and white girl, and we were kind of like, yeah, okay, you know. Not especially <laughs> me, I was like, all right, Colin, you can do the vocal or whatever. And then I'm just standing outside, and I hear her sing. Wow. And I go in, I go, who is singing? And I look over, and I see JoJo in there, like this little 12 year old, and I'm like, where did you learn how to sing like this? Oh my God. And, and she carried that record. For me, I feel that record could easily have gone a little bit too, like, nah. it just worked because of her vocal. And I think yeah. it also works because I'm so dirty on the beat. It's like crazy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's kind of like, even the rock element of the guitars are kind of like not really rock. It's almost right. like hip hop version of rock. Mm-hmm. And I think that's why it worked. And uh, when we were done, you know, I remember Vincent Herbert was the A&R person. And uh, he just said, I'm just releasing it the way it is. Like, and I said, the way it is? I said, yeah. And he put it out. And I mean, that record blew up. Yeah. Like from, that, was, that was really one of our big hits. Like that really, but it also opened up to a whole side that we really hadn't worked with. All yeah. of a sudden, we were in studio with a ton of pop, yeah. Like almost Disney. And, and honestly, we weren't very good um. with that. No, we, 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 we did a lot of records like that, that I feel we, we, we lost a little bit of our soul. Yeah. And I think, yeah, we just didn't feel it as much as these. I mean, we do, the reason why we left our country, our friends, our family really was to do R&B and hip hop, you know. And right. I think we just didn't have the same passion sometimes. Yeah, I feel like Max Martin and that crew, they really dominated the pop charts. But what you, can guys, you, do? you guys had, <laughs> you guys walked into R&B and you guys did great yeah. in that. But yeah. so, sometimes it just doesn't work out yeah. the way that you envision it. But yeah. I mean, I just got to talk about this record here. And even before I talk about this Solange record, San, Sandcastle Disco. Which oh, is one my of my God. Favorite. Oh, my but, God. I, mean, I just mentioned so many songs you guys did. Like, and some of them are singles. Some of them are album cuts. Like, what was your approach during your career? Did you guys want songs to be singles was it more about creating the record 100 like, percent 
<laughs> I mean, you know, it's ultra competitive. I don't think people realize. I know it's, of course, super competitive now as well. But the yeah. streaming element, there's so much music coming out. So there's a, just a larger uh, scale of people making music. Back then, we were like five, six, seven, eight guys. The Rodney Jurgens, the Babyface, and the Jimmy Jams, and the Teddy Riley's kind of before us, but, you know, was massive in the time. And Timbaland, and again, yeah. you know, I'm sorry. And, and we just had like, so much competition. So every time we were doing a song, it had to be the single. Also, mm. because we charged so much money. Right. So, you know, the record <laughs> companies would not pay this unless it was a single. So wow. as, as much as that sounds like heaven, the pressure is on. You know, if yeah. you can compare it to like a sports player or whatever, and, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo has to go on that court and he has to make something incredible every time. Yeah. You know, just like we're watching the Michael Jordan, you know, documentaries and yeah. are in, you know, Kobe, our hero here in L.A. Um, yeah. And it really was like that. Like, it was like we had to deliver not just good songs, no, but like classics. Yeah. <laughs> because if we didn't do it, you know, Face or Timbaland or, you know, anyone else would do it. You know, or Shakespeare, where was around that time. You know, yeah. it was, uh, you know, very, very competitive. That's amazing. Underdogs, so, underdogs, of course. Underdogs, Harvey, yep. I gotta give him a shout out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so let's talk about this. This this Solange record, Sandcastle Disco. I love this song. Like to this day, like even when it first came out, it was just so fresh. Like take me back to that song. It was completely different than what we normally would do, and it's actually a record I did without Colin. I did that record with a guy called Sean Hurley, who's the okay. bass player for John Mayer, and uh, Solange came in, and I just really connected with her. Um, she was so hippie <laughs> and so <laughs> bohemian. And, you know, we, I, I had a whole side of me I never really showed people, which was yeah. like more electronica. Like I really listened to a lot of like Flying Lotus and whatever. Like, you know, the more, I know it's not commercial, but it's like my favorite personally. Like, you know, that's what I listen right. to. And she would play all these records and I would know them all. She's like, what? And she kind of pushed me to go out of the comfort zone. Um, and we started doing, uh, you know, that bass loop and then that crazy beat, which is actually a beat that was called Mary Mary that Ron DMC used mm -hmm. for an old record. I think it's called Mary Mary, that break beat. We actually got sued for it. So that's interesting. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so, so, so Solange is just dancing in the studio and we ended up putting the microphone in the room, not in the vocal booth, but in the room, because that's where she wanted to do it. She did that whole vocal, bare feet, and just retro style. Wow. Uh, show I'm playing live bass, you know, and I'm cutting that beat up on the turntable. Like, it was literally like a live session, and it was like making live music, which is not something you do so much as hip-hop producer. Wow. And uh, it was just incredible. And when it was done, I just looked at some lines going, wow, like, thank you for pushing me because I, I would normally just do my normal beat and whatever right. snare was hot, you know. This is the time when Neptunes is coming in, you know, they're like, damn, now we got to compete with those motherfuckers? Yeah. <laughs> damn, can we get a rest here? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> um, so, so uh, yeah, and I'm proud of that record. I'm proud because it's out of my comfort zone. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and you know, so Chuck, we're almost out of time here. There's so much history. Sure. Yeah. We got to do this again soon, but like, yeah. just, you know, you've been in the industry for so many years now, hip hop and R&B have both changed so much, yeah. you know, since your, since your start, even the last 10 years, the two genres right. have really changed. Like, how do you kind of approach music now? Like for me as an R&B lover, when I listen to some of those songs you do, like I miss those sounds, like those bridges that you guys used to do, those great. Oh, that's so good. You bring that up. People yeah. don't do the bridges anymore. No, they don't. Like just how do you approach music now? So I'm one of the few guys, like, I have a lot of my friends who are like 90s hip hop rules and new hip hop is like, you know, it's not really hip hop or they yeah. call it like, that's rap and this is hip hop. That's all the fucking same. You know, let's, yeah. let's <laughs> get off that rap hip hop. But right. it's just, let's just call it hip hop rap. Whatever you want, it's the same thing. It's so dumb, I feel, to spend time on that. And I personally think hip hop is just as hot right now as it was mm. in the 90s. Whoever's like saying, are, are you not listening to the future? Are you not listening to Kendrick? Are you not mm -hmm. listening to Drake? I mean, do you want me to keep going? Like, right. you know, Travis 
Scott, like, are you yeah. fucking kidding me? Are you telling me that he's not as dope as, you know, Bismarck or Big Daddy or Public Enemy or whatever? I think they are. You know, right. so I like to, and it's always been our strength. One of the reasons maybe we didn't get so much stuck in the sound and can yeah. still make music is that we actually are music lovers and we, we love the new shit. Um, Tierra Whack. I mean, yeah. come on. Don't tell me you don't get that. That shit's right. hot. But can we get Tierra to do a whole song instead of two minutes, maybe? Be great. Right. You know, like, and I think that's some of the things I feel has happened a little bit. The streaming is anything is wrong is that it gets rushed and yeah. more music. I think Chuck D from Public Enemy said it so well that, you know, it's more quantity and less quality. Right. And that kind of takes you away from sitting down and enjoying these records as we used to do. Now right. we're getting just hit with so much. But I think they're great. I love She. I think Summer Walker got a cool little sexy thing going. You know, mm -hmm. I think there are many great, great artists out there. So I'm, 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 I'm not kind of like feeling that. I know '90s R&B. Let's just be real. You can't fuck with that shit. Yeah, you no, know? you can't. <laughs> you can't fuck with that shit. So if we can just get off that, not comparing it because you can't. Yeah. Then, no. then, then I think there's plenty of great music coming out. Yeah, but, but what about like the budgets? Like in the '90s, R&B and hip hop so so much. Like you can't you can't compare it to that today. Like no. so, like how do you kind of approach it as a producer? Are you still charging the same rates that you did once upon a time? Because you were charging a lot of money back then. <laughs> yes, we were. Oh, so. uh, you know, listen. These days, you know, we're blessed. We have a catalog that's yeah. making great money. So you know, we're not as desperate to necessarily be on every record and compete with yeah. everybody. Even though we certainly still have it in us. I think my biggest pleasure has been discovering Maya B, mm. who is our new artist. Um, you know, she inspired me to kind of go in the studio again, and you know, she she would laugh when she heard this because I wasn't really like getting me in the studio was not easy. Mm. You know, and uh, she brought me back in, like working to six in the morning, making mm. beats wow. from scratch, and you know, bringing out the eight oh eight and the Lindrums and shit. And, you know, <laughs> just because she's from that generation, where that wow, you got an eight oh eight, you know, you got Lindrum. But uh, so so you know, I I still get really inspired working with artists, but they gotta inspire me. I think maybe yeah. that's the difference now is I'm a little more spoiled. Yeah. You know, we got a new kid called Miles, who's a rapper who I think is really, truly special. So, yeah. you know, I think we're getting into developing artists a little more and enjoying that. And then let also bring that new generation in of producers, let them do the thing. And we can tell them maybe instead of going on Splice and right. take a loop that everybody else has, mm. maybe you play your own, right? Real Isn't that a little more fun? Yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about Maya B really quickly here. That's your artist. You've been grooming yeah. her, working with her. And yeah. you've worked with the legends, Whitney Houston, Tony Braxton, <laughs> Monica, Jojo and Monica at very young ages. Like, what inspires you about working with Maya B right now? The thing that inspires me about her is her thinking completely outside the box. She really is hard to define. Like, I wouldn't even put her in an R&B category. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, she listens to Angel Olsen, who I don't know is, but I found out because she's playing it <laughs> nonstop. But she is a singer-songwriter. Like, she mm -hmm. really is a writer and a songwriter that just constantly inspires me with what she writes on top of our beats because it's so unexpected. You know, it also takes a little while to get her sound right and get, yeah. like, people to understand who she is because she's so full of ideas and going so many direct directions. But I feel this new record that Jonas uh, G. Berg uh, did, who is another Dane, who's an incredible producer, mm. um, Sync featuring St. John. We're kind of okay. like, we're kind of like hitting yeah. something with that. And I can see, you know, she's over a million now on YouTubes and, you know, or streamings and stuff like that. So yeah. I think, you know, we're kind of getting her sound. We're taking, you know, she's 20 years old, you know, like, mm. so we, we're just kind of having fun with that. and. Artist development is a lot more. I had got a whole new respect for the Sylvia mm -hmm. Rones and the Ella Reeds and the Clive Davis and the, you know, yeah. Craig Kalmans and whoever they are out there because it's not as easy as you think to just come with an artist and get people to really, because we don't want to create just an artist. We want to create a legend. Yeah. And, and I think today with the music industry, artist development, some would say it's lost, but I feel like the other part of it is just that with the internet, it's so easy to access all the information it that is. maybe some of these younger artists don't feel like they need the guidance anymore. 
Um, I have to say I haven't experienced that. Everybody okay. I talk to, I mean, when they, when, no matter how cocky they are, when they come yeah. into our studio and they see the Tupac Platts and the Whitney Platts, <laughs> they get really quiet. Yeah. You know, because they know there's a difference in having a streaming hit as supposed to be like someone that never will go away. You will always remember forever. Right. You know, and it takes a whole different kind of devotion to become someone like that. It's and if your ambition is to just have a hit and be have a cool streaming mode, make some money and yep. you know, buy your Lamborghini and Ferrari and that's cool and then you end up maybe without it later. But but you know, that's cool with me. You know, I, I that's fine with me. But if you wanna be Prince, if yep. you wanna be Whitney or Tupac, whatever, you got some real fucking work to do. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so Chuck, you mentioned a couple of people you're working on. What can we expect from you coming up? I think you know we're gonna focus on on finishing Maya's album. We, we her EP is pretty much done now, so okay. it's coming out now soon. Um, and we're gonna do the album. Um, then I think we're gonna get into the hip hop game again with our new mm. rapper. Um, yeah. And we we'll continue working. You know, we we constantly work with people. You know, all the time. So. You know, we, we're just a little more, we're just blessed that we don't have to like, you know, you know, we have to jump on everything and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. We can also have some wine. Yeah. <laughs> Those days when you're in the studio, five days a week, working with oh everyone. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Not happening. It's <laughs> amazing. Well, so I, I just wanted to thank you once again for joining us on this. Like I said earlier, I feel like you guys have done so much work in the thank industry so for R&B, for hip hop, and we just wanted to highlight it. And Anytime you need us, man, just hit us up. Thank you. We're going to support you. So, I mean, just keep doing your thing. And, uh, you know, we'll talk. We got to do this again soon. You have too many thoughts. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So we'll talk about it soon. So you take care and uh, Great, stay safe out there. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Take care. Yeah. Okay, bye.